Hey, welcome to the 278th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Jesse Thomas, Dave Fairman, and Joey Family. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan, and today we have Matt Millam on the podcast. He's a creative executive at Amazon. He was also at Sony. He's been at Warner Brothers. He's worked for a bunch of different companies developing features and TV shows. And he's like the person that, you know, you bring a project to to try to get made at Amazon. He's in the TV drama department. So you got a TV drama, bring it to him. But please do it through your agent or manager. That is right? that is the truth, Ruth. Yeah, that's what we learned. Uh, <laughs> one of the many things, you know, I think that we talk about so many different great things about development and the nature of how it works and all of that. And uh, we get pretty philosophical about the nature of being an executive, which is really great. And I think the takeaway, the, the big takeaway for me that I think listeners should kind of clue into is that executives are are passionate people. They're nerds just like you and me. And the reason that you get into being a film executive or a TV executive is because you love telling stories as well. And so I think that the, there used to maybe be a, this mentality of like studio notes or development hell and all that stuff is complicated and weird and hard. But like to know that they are in the trenches with you and kind of fighting the good fight alongside you, I think is a thing that's worth reiterating. And Matthew is a living proof of it. Cool. Well, yeah. Before we talk to Matthew, I thought a quick subject we can touch on just for a few minutes is I'm curious, Matt, like what your strategies are for making your day on set when you have way more stuff to shoot than you have time for. Something I'm dealing with now on this project, we have, I'm working with these football players and with each football player, I need to shoot an entire 30 second commercial, a PSA, an AR experience, some gifts, some messages to corporate <laughs> for the company we're doing this for. And these are non actors and they're all, you know, about like they have other things on their mind. They also all make like millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> so I don't know how important this thing is for them. You know, I feel like I'm just going as fast as I can, but making my day is, it's hard. You know, I find that I'm, I have to kind of compromise on some things. Like, what's your strategy in terms of like, ordering. I mean, obviously you have an assistant director and things that help you figure out the order of the day, but how do you make sure you get the good stuff? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, I think, look, you prioritize things, right? Like I think that there were experiences has, has taught you a few things about how likely it is that people will show up on time, give or take, you know, you do a little recon, you figure out like how close are the people? Are they on a schedule? Is there somebody they are holding their hand to make sure that they get there on time, all that stuff? Because, you know, schedules are variable and oftentimes athletes in particular or musicians, there's all sorts of people who just like are on these kind of whirlwind tours all the time where they're just kind of constantly doing things. And so doing that recon to learn how likely it is that they'll be there when you need them there is important. And then also, right. And I, and just, just to be clear, I mean, like it doesn't have to be a commercial or with non actors or anything, but every job has like, well, we have to be out of this place by 3 PM or we lose the light yeah. at this time or every, there's no job that doesn't have a time limit of some sort. You know, there's the, um, just kind of stacking your day such that it's strategic and also that you're, you're putting your stuff, your most important stuff a little bit earlier in the day so that you're not rushing it. And the the thing that can be really frustrating, I think, is when when you're on something and the logic of the day dictates that you don't put things that are the, the most important things early in the day. That's when it's a especially huge bummer. When it's just like, oh, it's efficient to shoot it in this way where you're kind of shooting less right. important in this direction and, and then the, in this right direction. exactly the light doesn't help you out or the location is strange or one cast member isn't going to be there until later in the day that stuff really those logistical things can really you know create some complications and then i think the other thing is you just have to like really lean on your team and and communicate with them and it's not an accusation it's not an attack but your ad knows and your producers know how ambitious the day is. And, you know, if you work with them and say, look, I, I genuinely don't know how to get this. This is the, the essential amount of stuff and we've done the math and it's not going to go faster than the physics of rolling cameras and moving them around and, you know, and, and figuring out like, uh, is it, is it a second camera or is it, you know, there are certain things that you can do that money will fix it. And then sometimes it's just like, you literally can't go faster. 
And like having those conversations early is really tricky because, again, you don't want to sound like you're blaming someone, but also your job is to make all of the things that you have been hired to shoot good. And a producer's job and an AD's job is to get them in on budget and on time. And you and I, I think both are really conscientious of collaborating with those other departments because they're oftentimes our friends. We're, you know, team players, all of that stuff. But if the pieces aren't good, everyone loses, right? And so, you know, you do have to to voice that. And, and look, I don't know. There's not, there's not a good answer when you when you really are just like backed against a wall and there's not a, a way to really to do it, you know? And I think the answer is like, hey, let's work together to figure out what can we do to make this more achievable because I'm having, I, I want to deliver for you, you all and I'm having a hard time seeing this current plan working the way we need it to. Right, but there, there is something to, as a director, you know your limitations. You know we have to shoot the scene in three hours and there's a chance that the weather won't cooperate or there'll be clouds or someone's going to get there late or whatever or like a gag's not going to work. And so don't you think as a director, part of your job is to figure out what is like the minimum number of shots and setups that we need to tell this story? Certainly, um, certainly. I, I, and I guess what I'm saying is, is that like you can you can take that up to a certain point. You can say, OK, well, this can be a one -er, and this will shoot a medium and a close simultaneously. So we have things to cut to because, you know, the likelihood that they'll get it perfect in one take is going to be hard but we don't have time to change setups there are a lot of strategies you're right I and mean, i guess what i'm saying is i'm sort of assuming that you've already em employed all of those strategies and the math still doesn't work yeah i mean it doesn't but i, I like to kind of explore the nuts and bolts like i guess here's a super specific question if you're running late and you do one take and it's kind of let's say you know somebody reading a a teleprompter and they they're saying like 10 sentences or something you know it's like a minute long take you do a take, and it seems like they nailed it. Do you do a second take? Yeah. I, so a lesson that I have learned many times is that doing the take is the fastest part of the whole filmmaking process. You know, like a minute-long take is frankly pretty rare. Most of the time, they're a lot shorter than that. I would sometimes do one take no, but if you're doing a whole scene a I minute's mean, not longer. yeah yeah but then uh, you know once you're into coverage i would do some people call it a line rama where i would you know i would kind of take it chunk by chunk real fast and be like you know in, in a single like we're still rolling and i would be like okay or i won't need you to say hello give me five different flavors surprise me on the first one okay now disappoint me you know and just like fire it off that way and that's a way of like getting as many options as you can it's not uh, sometimes actors hate it you know that's not always a thing that they love and it, it and it oftentimes will dictate your edit in a way that uh i'm sure you dislike as a person who's so edit conscientious but um that that's a technique specifically that i will use i'll do like one or two takes where you just get it all the way through and you know you're covered and then i'll kind of get in and, and nitpick chunk by chunk as fast as I can without breaking or resetting and no one's flying in to fix looks or any of that stuff. And that to me is oftentimes a technique that gives you a little bit more safety in the edit to craft something without spending a ton of time. But but my my point being resetting cameras, mo moving, reset, like moving around, all of that other stuff, the stuff in between the takes is the stuff that takes. I mean, even just cutting and restarting. Right. Like exactly. when you say cut, let's go again right away. And the AC is like, okay, hold on. Let me grab the yeah, plate. Yeah. I'll, okay. I, what I take say, is this? I and, say hold there, still rolling. And I call it nice and loud, as loud as I say cut or as loud as I say action. And I say, you know, just to kind of explicitly be like, no, we're still going. Editors don't love it, but it sounds to me like this is a situation where you have more time in post than you do on set, relatively speaking. Yeah, I don't mind long takes. I mean, I roll, I'll do like 20 takes in one roll because I just hate cutting because it's just everyone like runs in and starts changing. But then the problem is you do 20 takes and then you cut and then the costumer runs in and she's like, yeah, he had a little bit of like water on this on his shirt down here. You're like, Ugh, does that mean we have to do, <laughs> do this all over again? Um, I didn't even notice it. By the way, the line thing, I don't really 
do that, but you said maybe sometimes actors don't like it. I, I agree that trained actors probably often don't love it, but non-actors, I think, do love it, you know? And it's my experience with non-actors is like, the more you can tell them to do, the better, you know? The, the more they're just kind of trying to figure out what they're supposed to do, the worse. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and also so it, it makes it, it sets an expectation of like, you don't have to do it perfectly. If I asked for five takes, then there's no way that the expectation is that you need to get it right on the first one. Or even that there is a right, you know, the, the, again, you have to be thoughtful of like, okay, where you have to pick your edits a little bit in those chunks, because if you go too short, then that stuff ends up being unusable. And if you go too long, then you might as well have just done a full take anyway. And so thinking that through a little is, is the move. But that that's that certainly if we're talking nuts and bolts, a way that I can kind of expedite getting things done. Yeah, I try to always steal shots. Like if when I know it's like we're out of time or like 15 minutes over, we're in lunch, meal penalties or whatever, because everyone's supposed to be at lunch. Sometimes I'll be like, OK, can you turn around? Let's see your back. Just say a few lines in front of you. OK, now turn, and I might, I'm trying to like pick up little pieces before I cut where I feel like the lighting is kind of acceptable. I mean, and this is not how you should make your Sundance short. This is like how you are cramming a bazillion shots into one day. But those those skills do translate into your Sundance short because or your Sundance feature, because every filmmaker ever is always going to deal with the limitations of time and money. And the more you practice that, the more you understand the ways in which you you can deal with that. You know, and what what things you're willing to sacrifice and what things you're willing to not like for as the example, Linerama, I really will privilege performance and choices over edits sometimes for better or for worse. You know, things, things being cutty isn't the end of the world for me. I know that you care about that a little bit differently. And so and that's not a value judgment one way or the other, but it just means that like lineramas make a ton of sense for me, whereas sometimes it might make more sense for you to just like do have fewer total takes, but to just do it the whole way through, you know? Well, for me, the reason casting makes such a difference is because I would love to get a variety of angles, camera moves, et cetera, and good performances. But when the performances aren't quite landing, I would rather get more takes of the performances from less angles and just kind of live with it because no number of angles is going to save you. Now, the problem is in commercials, when you're doing a 30 or 15 second commercial, you cannot, they have to be 30 or 15 seconds. And if someone takes a long pause between two lines and you timed it out and you don't have time for that long pause, you need a second angle, you know, and sure people I know are like producers or whatever, always like, can't you just shoot like 6K and just like crop into a close up and you can, but it always sucks. And it's always kind of obvious and it's always like un it's an unnecessary cut you know like you're just cutting time so the continuity because it's from the identical angle identical everything sometimes it's kind of obvious that you cut out time from a continuity standpoint so yeah it's a uh, it's something and it's like something that I, i've just been thinking a lot about lately like the difference between working with like clients and working on your own stuff is that when you're working on your own stuff, you decide when it's good and when you can move on. And when you're working with clients, like someone else, like when you ask someone, like, are you good or do you need something else? Then, you know, a lot of times they'll feel like they should try to get something else. Yeah. And it's such a waste of time. It kind of depends on like their experience level. I dislike very much when I'm in a client situation and I know that we need more and, and I get the note that like so-and-so is happy we should be moving on oh right yes Brutal. that happens all Brutal. the time too yeah yeah and you're like and if I they know, do, if you do do it again they're like oh on this take let's don't say coca-cola I'm like okay so now it becomes a, a different take and it's potentially not usable because it's different from the script but it's going to have my note that i wanted to give them moral of the story is just shoot for yourself uh, I'll, nobody I'll, else look this is a low down dirty secret that i think every client who's, who's savvy knows or, or agency producer is like sometimes that's another reason to not call cut is to if you're doing a series you know you you keep going until you get it then you call cut then you check you in. get what you want yeah yeah you get what you yeah. want yeah exactly and look sometimes i'm right and sometimes i'm wrong but I, I feel like my obligation is 
to get what I want because I think that's what they're going to want to. And if they knew better than me, then they just wouldn't have hired me in the first place. They'd just be directing it themselves. Right. Well, uh, okay. on that note, uh, before we hop into our wonderful conversation with Matt Millam of Amazon, uh, we wanted to remind you that we have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash just shoot it pod. It's the place where you can throw us a couple bucks uh, to show your gratitude and to support people like our editor, Sarah, our uh, social media maestro, Derek. You know, um, they've been putting in a lot of hard work. I hope that you have noticed that our ads are maybe a little bit better and that the experience is a little bit cleaner for everyone. We've kind of upgraded some of our podcasting platform stuff and we are just working hard to keep uh, this show moving along and genuinely it would not be there if it wasn't for Sarah and Derek and all of their help uh, and for your support. So we appreciate it. You know, if you're not into uh, Patreon right now or you can't uh, afford it, uh, that's okay too. We'll continue to make the show. But uh, maybe uh, jump on uh, social media. Give us a shout out, you know, a like, a share. There's a lot of ways to sh- support the show. So uh, we appreciate it any which way. But if you want to throw us a couple bucks, patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. Yeah. And if you give us 10 bucks, we'll send you a hat. Which, you gotta mail out some hats. Uh, awesome. Well, without further ado, and maybe after a sponsor or two, we'll talk with Matt Millam. Well, we're here with Matt Millam. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome. So, Matt, you're in the drama department at Amazon. Tell us a little bit about, just kind of set the table for, for people, what, what you do, what the world is like for you right now. The world for me, what do I do? So I, I'm, I'm the, the joke that I make to my friends is I'm someone who has an opinion that gets paid to give my opinion to people that are way more artistically talented than I can ever be. So, you know, the, the majority of my day is spent reading and assessing material that could be potentially, you know, good series for the network. And then, you know, advocating for that material and trying to just to like assess it and give notes on it once the material's in production and helping to manage the productions. And, you know, a lot of my time is actually spent meeting with writers and directors and just talking to them about what they're working on and stuff of theirs I've seen or read that I particularly responded to and trying to figure out ways to be in business with them. And then a lot of that's actually weirdly, like before this call, I was watching two new cuts of a show that I'm working on, uh, just preparing to give notes to the creative talent involved in that. And that's just a lot of the day-to-day, honestly, just consuming content and then trying to figure out can that content work on our service. So, so can you just to be like more specific? How much of like how much say do you have in green lighting a show? You know, I mean, I have I have a a small amount of say in green lighting a show. The the way that I think of my job ultimately, and this is my first boss, this guy Nathan Kahane taught me, is that the job of an executive is to both be a patron for artists that we love and then to advocate to death for the artists that we love, right? And so, like, there are shows and movies that I've worked on in my career that I thought should have gotten made that didn't get made, but I went in and I was like, this is particularly interesting to me for these reasons, and here's why I think it'll have cultural impact and an audience will respond to it and why I particularly like this artist. And I can argue till I'm blue in the face. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I think that that's, like, I can't ultimately say, like, we're making the show, right? That's up, that's up to people that, that are smarter and get paid more than I do. But, you know, I can, it's, I think a, an executive is not an executive unless they're willing to die for something that they believe in. And I, I obviously say die in a, in, a, in a hyperbolic sense, but you have to be willing to put your job on the line for something you believe in. Otherwise, why are you doing the job? Right. So the show that you just gave notes on the cuts for, is that a show that you brought to Amazon? That is a show that I was heavily involved in bringing to Amazon. Yes, it was. It was a show I knew the producers really well and uh, had been advocating for them to bring it to Amazon. They brought it in. It came directly to my boss. But as a result of my relationship, I was in that room and then I advocated for us to buy it and I developed it. And then when the time came for the green light decision, I advocated for us to make it and we made it. So I, I, I did my part as far as I'm concerned in terms of like getting it up to the one yard line. And I advocated as best as I could for it with my bosses. And luckily this time, they they tended to agree with me. Though I'll be totally honest with you, the name of the game for an executive, and I would actually say the name of the game for anyone involved in this business is failure because you know most people aren't going to get what they're passionate about made. And that's okay. I think that you have to be willing to accept that you're going to hear no 90% of the time. And then you're going to hear yes 10%. And even with that 10%, you could still fuck it up. You could still make something that was bad, right? I could still you know, be involved with something. And it's actually weirdly, I won't say easier for an executive or a producer, but I think there is a, 
holistic difference because having having been in you know, friends with, with many writers and directors and having dated a couple of writers and directors. Like it's one thing if I work on a show and I'm involved in it and the show doesn't work, right? Like that's not a representation of me. That's just a show that I worked on. But if you're a writer or director or creative or something, like oftentimes that show is coming from a personal experience for that creator, for that artist. And so when the show doesn't work, I feel awful for them because they put all of this time, this blood, sweat and tears, and they're probably projecting some of their own self into the characters and the world they've created. And so that kind of projection, I can't imagine. And I have a lot of empathy and sympathy for artists that are willing to put themselves in that situation and, and face criticism in a, in, a, in a major way, often from people who are like armchair critics, which listen, I think we're all armchair critics to a certain degree, but I think about like, there's a slight difference between like Pauline Kale and someone that like writes on Twitter. And I think it's a, it's a lot easier to be a Twitter critic than it is to be someone who can write like long form criticism. Yeah, yeah. R- r- tweeting meh is, you know, a yeah. hashtag the name of your show is pretty rough. <laughs> well, the other thing that I find interesting, and we don't have to, this doesn't have to become a conversation about, you know, 21st century uh, film and TV criticism, but I'm fascinated now, especially with the rise of streaming, how people will often begin their critique like 15 minutes into something. And I'm like, listen, man, you might hate this, but you got to give it like, give it the length of the show. It's 45 minutes to an hour out of your life in most instances. Like, if you want to write man, write man at minute 61, not at minute 16. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> right. So I think what's like kind of heartening to hear from what you're saying is that even you as a creative executive have like the failures and get excited about things that end up not going. Cause I think a lot of times people that are bringing you projects and pitching to you and especially newer filmmakers have the mindset that they're trying to appeal to you. And if you say yes, then it's good. And if you say no, then it's gone. But like, it's interesting to see that you are also just like on the step ladder to getting something made and that you also can be, you know, have wins and fails in trying to get things made once things get to you and frankly skin in the game also you know like i think it, it, you know you were saying you, you have to put your life on your on the line quote, quote, and like you know it is true that emotionally maybe you know you don't relate to it in the same way that a person who's writing about their own life story would but like you know it is your reputation and your you know your job that your your livelihood that you are in a certain sense putting on the line and so like uh, I've always admired executives who are willing to to fight for something and say that they love something. Because you know that that's kind of special, actually. But so to, to Orin's point, I think it, it is interesting just to to remind everyone that like executives oftentimes are fighting just as hard as you are, just in a different way. There, there's a different set of skills and politics to to navigate. There are, you know, I think, listen, I'm not trying to aggrandize myself or my friends that I think are also. No, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. (laughs) And I appreciate that. It makes me feel better about who I am, right? But it's, 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 again, I credit a lot of my worldview on being an executive to my first boss, this guy, uh, Nathan, who runs Lionsgate now. And like Nathan literally said to me at one point, like, he's like, I don't pay you to like track specs. I don't pay you to watch stuff because I pay you for your fucking opinion. And if you don't have one, like you're not getting your money. Like that's, and that to me was what it was always about. And he would really, he would get really obstinate with me sometimes. And sometimes I know he would like something, but he, then he would challenge me and make me defend my point of view. And uh, I think that's, I think that's the name of the game. Like everyone wants to be Robert Evans, right? Uh, every, everyone wants to be Don Steele. Uh, everyone wants to be like these great studio executives that advocated, but the reason they're like known is like yeah, Robert Evans is known for the voice and all the like the the antics he did, and, and Don is known for being and for being in three D and for yes, exactly. It's just a, a plain air animation joke, guys. Sorry. No, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, he's it's it, listen that Comedy Central show was uh, Kim Notorious was fantastic, but uh, no, but it's it's like that's that's a big piece of it, right? And I think anyone like I get really angry at executives who are all they do is they try to play the game because I'm like, man, like if you don't, if you don't want to like get into a tussle, then like, I'd rather, I don't want to be in the ring with you. Like I'd rather like actually have like arguments. It's so funny uh, because sometimes I'll have conversations with agents and managers and other executives. And there's like a thing that I worked on and they're like, no offense, but that I just, I didn't, I didn't respond to that thing. And I was like, dude, don't qualify your answer. Just tell me it sucks. Like, like I let's have a debate about this. Cause sometimes I may agree with you that it didn't turn out the way it should have turned out. And that's for a host and a litany of reasons that have nothing to do with the creatives involved. It just, you can, I'm sure you guys have probably done this in your own endeavors where you set out to do something. And for 
a, a host of things you can't control. It just doesn't work out the way it should. And that's just, that just, that's the game. You got to start over and try again. That's like every single job. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I think. Not, not like, I'm like, exact well, opposite. I nail it every time. I, I'm like, eh, almost got it. Almost. Almost I'll, what I imagined. <laughs> all I remember is when I was a kid, I must have been like 12 years old. And Bruce Campbell came to my town because he had written that book. Like, sure. uh, what's it called? Like, hit me on the chin no, or whatever. No, no, no. It was, like, it was uh, his autobiography. If chins right? could kill. Right. If chins could kill. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And we were, we were at the we were at the uh, the now long closed Barnes and Noble in my hometown. And this guy who thought he was being funny was like, "Dude, why did you uh, why did you star in Congo? That movie was a real piece of shit." And and Bruce Campbell goes, "Let me let me ask you a question." The guys go, "Okay." And he goes, "If I brought you a project that was based on the guy who uh, it was it was a, it was a project based on a novel by the guy who wrote Jurassic Park." who had an Academy Award winning producer and was being produced and was being made by one of the biggest studios in town, would you make that movie? And the guy was like, yeah, sure. I guess I'd make that movie. And Bruce Campbell was like, congratulations. You just made Congo. Now shut the fuck up. And it was like, you, you can't know. You can't every, no one said, it's something else. And I'll stop saying this, but it's something else Nathan said to me when I was his assistant. It's like, he met with this producer who made a lot of really crappy movies. And after the producer left, Nathan came out to my desk and he was like, uh, if you produce that one of that guy's movies, would you put it, the poster on your wall? And I was like, no, man, like those movies all suck. And he goes, here's the thing, man, every movie you work on, you should be proud of because like, again, no one said, no one's like wakes up to this morning and says, I want to make a bad movie. Everyone like is trying for something. Hmm. That's an interesting theory. Put a poster of everything I've made on my wall. Probably, probably <laughs> like, yeah, it's just like with cav caveats. Actually, I literally had a concept for a director's reel that is just... <laughs> scenes from things and what I would change if I shot, if I sure, could shoot Sure, sure. We had over. two hours to shoot this one. This, where I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm in overtime on this scene. Yeah, that's really funny. Um, well, so, so Matt, I want to take a, a step into the Amazon world specifically. I, I'm curious, we talk about a little bit about like mandates, different networks and different uh, streaming platforms. Everybody has kind of a different thing that they're looking for. And you know, I think that there are people who are like, oh, I wrote this spec and I think it's an FX show or I think it's a Comedy Central show or I think it's an Amazon show. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, most places have kind of a, a, a wish list or a set of, of kind of ideals, we'll say, um, that truly dictate what is a, a quote unquote an Amazon show. And it's hard for writers maybe to know specifically what you all are looking for or what you already have on that shopping list. But talk to us a little bit about Less like what Amazon is looking for right now, but more just in general, the idea of what a, a network mandate means to you. I'm, I, I want to answer this in two ways, one of which is going to be sort of annoying, but it's my core tenet and belief on like the, the quote unquote network mandate. And then we can get into probably more specifically what what you're what you're talking about, uh, Matt, which is. So my my belief, and this is something I, I said to an ex of mine because she was I asked, she was like, oh, like. I'm, I want to work on a new spec. Like, what are like what are, what are, what gets executives excited, right? Sort of. I was like, listen, it's one of it was it was like a piece of IP that's action oriented. It's all this stuff, and I was like, and you should not write that. And she goes, why not? And I go because I know you don't like this stuff, and if you write it and you sell it, it's actually the worst thing for you because then you'll just become ensconced and beating the person that writes the action piece of IP, and you'll want to kill yourself, right? And I, what I try to say to writers and directors when they're asking me that question is that like, you should write what you want to write. You should direct what you want to direct with the caveat of if what you're interested in is the subject of underwater basket weaving, then you have to understand that your audience is going to be incredibly small. So that means there's going to be a lot less interest in what you're trying to get done. So the budget's going to be smaller. The audience is going to be smaller and you have to be okay with that. So I, I always I, I always think that like the, to me I think about like you know Barry Jenkins did Moonlight and then from that was able to do all of these other amazing things that eventually led to him doing the Underground Railroad for us and like Barry just did Barry and I think that's an amazing like he he didn't bend or kowtow to anybody he stayed true to sort of his ethos as a creative and he does beautiful amazing things and I also think you know for some like I look at like Taika Waititi right like Taika just did Taika. And then he got Thor and Love of Thunder, but he's also doing like a Fox Searchlight movie about a young boy that's hanging out with Hitler, right? So it's like he's just doing what he wants to do. Catherine Bigelow just does the movies that she wants to do. And I think that like that to me, there's a clear vision and a singularity to those people. And that's why they're successful. Because I think, you know, like, like Jip Cameron 
it's not like he sort of like forced himself into like doing big high concept science fiction. Like that's just what he liked from the days he was working for Roger Corman and doing like Piranha and all these like ridiculous things that he was doing for Corman. And I think that's why his movies are so good. I think that's why Chris Nolan's movies are so good because they're speaking, they're, they're finding thematics and core pieces to them that are working and they're sort of headed towards that. So that's, I just, I think it's important for me. I, I just don't want to push people towards like trying to write to sell something. I want to push them towards like writing the stuff that they believe in. And if that lines up with a mandate, all the better. You know, but from a, a larger mandate perspective, I think everyone, by and large, especially at the the, the streamers, um, is just trying to find stuff that's going to resonate with an audience. And what that inherently comes down to is original concepts. And I know that's probably a really annoying thing for an executive to say because it's such a nebulous term. But I think that's really what it is. And I think that the stuff I would say to creatives all the time is like, think about your show within the confines of the competition of what you watch. Like instead of making yourself a creative, make yourself the viewer. And it's a Tuesday night and you've just come home from a hard day at work. You and your partner put down your like screaming five-year-old kids. They're in bed. You turn on the television. Like what do you want to watch after a hard day? And that's probably the mandate for a network, right? Because we want to provide not just content for viewers, but we want to provide joy and satisfaction for the people that are tuning it into that network. And the way you keep them on your network is you keep providing joy and satisfaction. And sometimes that's a very serious adult drama, but sometimes that's also like a big, dumb action show, right? And so I think ultimately it's looking for the originality within that sort of thought process that sort of comes down to what I think any successful network's mandate ultimately is. But it was another point I wanted to make on this front, which is that um, I, you know, I think that it's it's increasingly difficult to sort of ferret out those original ideas. Because if you think about, I mean, it's an obvious thing that's been talked about ad nauseum, but the idea that like, when we were all kids, because I'm assuming we're all roughly the same age, when we were all kids, it was a Friday night, like you had no options. Like if you wanted to go do something, you went to a movie theater or you turned on like HBO or you like, you know, watched a VHS or a DVD. And now obviously between video games and Twitter and like YouTube and just like the mindless entertainment we can do, it's becoming harder to find that piece of original content. And I think some people get really frustrated by that, but I actually think it forces everyone involved in entertainment to just push themselves harder to be like, okay, cool. So how do we subvert these expectations? How do we sort of undercut what people think they want and give them this really cool original idea? And sometimes that's IP. And sometimes that's sometimes I think the IP is the creative that's making it. I again I go back and I think about you know Barry and Taika and 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 Catherine Bigelow and like all of these amazing people that are creating content. Bong Joon Ho, like those are just original ideas, and they, the the artist becomes the IP in a lot of ways because they're so singular. So I, I think that's really the other piece of the mandate for uh, for networks is singular visions, right? Because I think that that's really what breaks through with an audience. Because I, I that's probably not exactly answering the question, but. Does you want me to go deeper or? Well, I, I have some follow up questions to that. I guess if the mandate is make a show that people are going to want to see, is there a difference between a Netflix drama and a Hulu drama and, a, you know, and an Amazon drama and an Apple Plus drama? Or do you think you guys are kind of all in the same business in terms of the type of content you're looking for? I think in the head of the executive at the specific network, there's a differentiation between what makes up Apple or Amazon or Netflix? I, I think, for example, when I worked at Warner Brothers, we always talked about the Warner Brothers Shield and like what a Warner's movie was, and like yeah, that informed Warner's ideology when it came to films. But then I would do anecdotal conversations either with friends back home, I'm from Tennessee originally, or when I, when I would travel and I wouldn't tell people what I did. I was just like, oh, what are you guys going to go see this weekend? And they'll be like, ah, we're going to go see the George Clooney movie. And I'm like, oh, you mean Ocean's Eleven? And I'm like, and they're like. Is, yeah, sure. That's what we're going to go. They had no clue. Oftentimes, the average consumer has no clue. And again, this is anecdotal, but I was on a trip in uh, Europe two years ago for a friend's wedding. I was taking the train from Belgium back to London, and I struck up a conversation with this older couple next to me. We're just talking to them, and this the the w wife was talking about stuff she enjoyed. I was like, oh, you know what? You might actually enjoy the show called The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I think it's really the the woman who created it. Uh, uh, Amy Sherman Palladino is like, very talented. And I think you would enjoy it. And she was like, and I was telling her, she's like, oh, where can I watch that? I was like, oh, if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch. She's like, oh, I have to buy it off Amazon Prime. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like if you, if you have the service, you can watch the content, right? And so again, for that consumer, they don't understand. They don't necessarily link the show to the service. And I think that's just how consumers are. I think that when you're trying to figure out if you're going to make your mortgage payment or not, like you're less concerned 
with the brand of what you're buying and more concerned with whether or not you're enjoying the content. And I think that's a good reminder for us that we have to get divorce ourselves sometimes from our, from our identity as entertainment people and more put ourselves in the, 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 the place of the consumer. So to go more directly to answer your question. Yes. I do think there are identities within networks. And again, I use, you know, when I was at Warner's Warner's from the time Jack Warner founded them in the 1930s made a lot of their, made a lot of their bones by doing gangster pictures. Right. And I think if you look around at the, the history of Warner movies, there's no one that does a gangster picture better than Warner's from stuff in the 1930s, all the way up to like the departed in 2006 or 2007. I forget the year it came out, but like that they have a lineage of that. Right. In the same way that like, when you look at universal and monster movies or like Sony doing more prestige movies. And so I think inherently, there becomes a thing that a, a studio is very good at doing and that does become part of the fabric of who they are but i don't necessarily think that like at the end of the day we're still all looking for when, when a spec goes to market you know warners isn't like oh it's not a gangster movie i can't go out and compete for it they want it like everyone else wants it if it's a good idea cool so now you just said the term when a spec goes to market which i'm assuming that's like you mean when someone writes a script and sends it to their agent and their agent is sending it around to different studios i guess i'm curious about like how you buy a show or choose to develop a show is it that an agent sends you a script or like how often is it that way and how often is it someone comes in and does like a pitch to you and obviously nowadays i'm assuming it's more they do it over zoom or something but but tell us like a, a little bit about the process of how you find a show and like how, how the whole pitching thing works. Well, so I'll answer that in two ways. I'll use an example for something I bought recently, but on the pitching side, and I'm one of the few, I hopefully no one's going to get angry with me when I say this. I actually am a huge advocate for writers to not pitch because my, oh, my, cool. that's great. Well, he, but here's why though. Right. And, and again, this, this having this, this comes from having a lot of writer friends and having, having been in, relationships with writers and like we would talk all the time about the the processes they built out the pitch and the amount of creative energy that a writer uses to craft to perfect a pitch the same amount of energy they use to craft to perfect a pilot script or a, a spec pilot right and so my thing is is if someone comes in and they pitch me a show and i don't buy it uh, they they're just left with this ephemeral idea right and so they can't get a job with that but if they spend the same amount of time and they write a spec pilot i may pass on a writer's spec pilot but then they have a sample they can use to go get staff they have a sample they can use to go like advocate for another job and so I'm like i for me personally i would rather have you know like a suitcase to carry around as opposed to just like an idea of a suitcase that one day i may have and so that's the reason i think that specking a pilot is better than and spending time on a pitch because again it's the same amount of it's six months no matter what you do and you know for an example of uh, something i recently bought there there's a a, a, a a spec that i just bought like probably eight nine months ago where a friend of mine who's a producer whose taste i really trust sent me um this what was essentially a writing sample and was like i want you to take a look at this i read it i was like this is not a writing sample like, I, this is a show that i want to go watch and i was like here are the you know here are the confines of how i can get the show made got on the phone with the writer, had really honest conversations about sort of what I thought the show was. I wanted to hear what their opinions were, make sure we were all on the same page and bought it and spent the last year developing it. And I don't know what's going to happen, but like, I think the, the, the writer has done an amazing job working on the the pilot. I'm very hopeful about it, but that, that was the thing where it was just a producer sending me something. But oftentimes, uh, or and to answer your question a little bit more specifically, is that it is a situation where an agent will just go out with a piece of material and say, Hey, we're going to the town with this. Like, what do you think? And you're just, you're reading and then you're, you're, and they're emailing you directly. Yeah. Yeah. The agents reach and agents calls me says, Hey, I've got this, this piece of material, would you take a look at it? And then I do and assess. And I will say that there are agents that I really trust there are, there are many agents who will call you and just sort of like throw spaghetti against the wall. And then there are agents that I really trust who, when they have a pilot, or when I was in the feature side, had a, a, a spec script that they were like, listen, I don't think you're going to like this. It has a lot of problems, but my client wants to take it out. I want to honor my client. I want to do right by my client. Would you please take a look at it? I would take a look at it. But then when that same agent calls me up six months later and says, hey, listen, cancel your lunch, stay in. You got to read this right now. It's the best piece of writing I've read in six months. Then I take that agent or manager seriously because I'm like, they don't, it's not a game of bullshit, right? It's, it's a, they actually have an opinion. And I'm much in my career, I've bought more stuff from agents who and agents and managers who advocate passionately and truthfully, as opposed to agents and managers who call me up and everything's the best thing they've ever read. Because it's like nothing, nothing could ever be, you, not everything that gets written is the best thing they've ever read. Right. 
And do you ever get unsolicited scripts or is it uh, pretty much there's a pipeline and it's through representatives? It's always through representatives. The only time that I get unsolicited submissions is either it's from a friend who I've known for many years and there's a level of trust and advocacy there on both sides for, or it's from producers who've already vetted it in some other way. Yeah, I just don't, I think there, it opens you up to way too many legal pitfalls to do it. I know that's, I, I, you know, I like to be totally honest with you, when I started, I was like 15 and I was, uh, I was a writer. I wrote a couple of specs and I actually got a manager and I would do the same thing that a lot of these writers are doing now, which is I would, at the time I would send like letters to agents and managers and production companies. And I got rejected a ton, but occasionally someone would read. So I, even though I'm not reading for legal reasons, that doesn't mean there's not producers or other executives at different companies that won't read. I just can't, given where I'm at, I can't. And it's, it's a it's a big policy for any major studio to not uh, uh, take unsolicited material. Yeah, that's that's super helpful to know. Yeah, kind, um, of, kind of on a, an official level. That's not, you know, interpersonal. Right. That's like literally Amazon's rule is yeah any major every major company i've worked for that was whether it was amazon or skydance or warner brothers or sony it's like the only place i was really reading unsolicited material was when i worked as an indie producer when i first started out and then i'll be but i'll be honest with you i also like i do look at stuff on the blacklist and that's technically unsolicited but that's going through a filtration system that sort of like provides a level of um you know provides a level of safety for everyone involved does the blacklist have tv pilots also now yeah mm -hmm. okay and it's a separate list than the feature list correct Okay, that's cool. And so once you like a script, do you just kind of go like make your decision if you want to work on it at that point? Or do you invite the writers or producers or whatever the creative team behind the script this project is in to pitch or talk more about the project? I personally like to have conversations with the creative involved in it just because I want to make sure we're all on the same page because it's like that. Maybe I see something and I'm like, oh, this thing's so awesome. And I talk to the writer, the writer's like, that is not, no, like that's not what I'm going for at all. And I think it's better to know you shouldn't get married when you're dating as opposed to like when you're three kids in. Right. And I try to like start it before there's any um, before there's any real creative conversations just to like, you know, like let's it's like I did that spec I told you about. Like I, I called the writer up. I was like, here's what I think the show is like. Here's what I'm interested in. Here's where I, th I would push and advocate for the show for. And if you're on the same page with that, we should like hold hands and go off on this thing. But if you're not into this for any reason, that's cool, too. And like, you know, go with God. And so like that's I like to have those conversations just so everyone's above board. And I also think it creates a sense of a spirit of core and, and companionship in the in the creative process where you know everyone's on the same page. Because let's be honest, if you're a, a writer or a director, you've probably been working on this piece of material for six months or m way more before I even see it, right? And if, when I come into the process, you know, and in, except for rare instances, we're gonna work on it together for probably at a minimum of 18 months, two years before whatever, like actually gets in front of a camera. So if we're not together now, like when the passion begins to wane, like six months to a year in, like you need to have a place to come back and get re-energized from. And I think that initial conversation for me, at least, and I think for the creatives that I work with really helps to be like, okay, what are we, what are we fighting for? What are the core tenants we're all interested in? Let's come back and refine these and just use that to sort of like re-energize ourselves when, when you run out of gas a little bit. Yeah. I, I love the, the reality of knowing that like, the gas tank will empty at some point. I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about your metrics for success. And I think understanding what it means to you specifically, and maybe what it even means to Amazon to be to make a, a quote unquote successful show. Is it buzz? Is it prestige? Is it awards? Is it some sort of internal metric, or is it just like kind of a consensus that you know this one worked? You know, how, how do you judge whether or not you nailed it, especially kind of absent of like Nielsen numbers? I, listen, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think it depends on executive to executive and network to network, obviously. I, you know, I'll take it from the you know, the first part of your question, like what does it mean for me? And I think it, it success for me means a couple of things, which is primarily it is the vision of the creative that I worked with. Is their vision realized in they, the way they want to realize, right? Because my only job really at the end of the day is to make sure I'm helping them as much as possible get from the beginning of the road to the end of the road. And so that's really important to me personally. But then sort of beyond that, it's like, is it good? Like, is it something that I can look at and be like, would my 11 year old self watch this show or movie and be like, yeah, man, that that's pretty cool. That's pretty fucking cool. Like, I really like that. Right. Cause I, that's, I always have to sort of return to that because it's, I'm, I don't know. I get really cynical the older I get, especially. And there are moments when I, ha when I'm in meetings, when I have to remind myself, 
like, oh, no, this is this is pretty cool. Like you're having this is a pretty cool like moment you're having with this piece of talent that you never thought you'd be able to like talk to. And like you're and we're, like, you know, thinking back to like when I was like 15 or 20 years old being like, it'd be really dope to be in a room with this person. And then I sometimes find myself in a room with that person as opposed to just and like you're hanging out with Harrison Ford. I mean, that was, yeah, actually, that was a moment where I was in a meeting with him once and I was just like, ah, oh, this is fucking, this is dope. I really like, this is really, really cool. Uh, and he's a really nice guy. But um, that, you know, that was a really big thing for me too. And then obviously there's the metrics of like, does it make societal and cultural impact? Because you could make stuff that's like the best show or movie in the world. But if six people watch it, it's like if a tree falls to the forest, no one's around to hear it. Does it really ultimately fucking matter? But that ultimately, if I, I work, if I get the privilege to work on something that I really, really love, like, and nobody sees it, I, I, to a certain level, I would also still consider that success, success, right? Because there's a lot of cult movies that I love. That I remember seeing The Big Lebowski the first time when I was uh, in high school, and I was in a theater in my hometown. It was like a 400 person theater, and there were six people in the theater, and my friend and I that were watching it were the only ones laughing. And I remember being like, oh, if I got, I mean, granted, it's the Coen brothers, so this is like, whatever. But like, I was like, oh, if I got to work on this movie, that, like, I wouldn't care if it made six bucks. Like, it's still a dope fucking movie that I'm sure like speaks to people. But so I, for me, it's an alchemy of sort of all three of those things. Is the creative, are they satisfied with the ultimate end result? Am I proud of the result? Does it have a cultural impact? And it's like, if you can get two, as Jack Nicholson said in um, uh, Mars Attacks, like two out of three ain't bad, right? Like if you can get two out of three of those things, it's ultimately not uh, necessarily a bad thing. I think the thing that I, I find hollow, when, when you work on something that everyone knows is not good, but for some reason finds like super big financial success, there's something a little bit hollow in that where you're like, ah, I sort of like, I'm part of the problem. You know, and it's like that, uh, that I think those can be tough moments because you'll get worked, but you're not necessarily like super engaged for why it worked. And I think I've worked with creative talent who knows that, that, that for whatever reason, the movie didn't quite hit the aspirations they wanted to make, but it still found cultural relevance. And they all, it's, it's the, that weird thing where they're like, I want another chance, coach. I want to go back again. I want to try this again because I know I can do better next time. And so I think that's a big piece of it. So to the network thing, I think it's customer engagement and customer joy, right? I think, I think it's a thing about where does the customer, does the viewer respond to the material are you making good stuff it's 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 and does the talent feel taken care of and happy so it's sort of a similar set of metrics i mean listen at the end of the day we like you know any of these streaming networks are a going concern right if if you're making a lot of content and no one's watching eventually you're going to go out of business so i think ultimately the real answer is you need to have people that are paying if you're netflix you need to have people that are paying $14.99 $14.99 a month to watch your content because if they stop watching your content, you go out of business. And I think that is a, if people are lying, if they don't say that it's about making sure you have eyes on, you have asses on couches watching your content. Yeah. We all know Quibi. Exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. No, uh, no disrespect to Quibi. They tried something. It was a, it was a, it was a failure what they tried, but you're right. No one showed up to watch those shows. Unfortunately, it's not in, it's funny because a lot of those shows seem to be finding success outside of the ecosystem of Quibi. So it's obviously they were making good content, but maybe the, maybe the delivery system wasn't exactly... Listen, what Matt, you're, you're talking to two guys with Go90 shows, so... <laughs> yeah, but I feel like Go90, it was a Verizon project, and Verizon, it wasn't Verizon's main... It wasn't their... The business their model wasn't... Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't, people were still buying if, cell phones. If people watch, well, yeah. Yeah. The so, crazy thing about Go90, Same though, with Amazon. Well, yeah, I, the, the crazy thing to me about Go90, though, is I feel like Go90 did some really subversive, cool content. And to your point, if like Verizon, it's, well, it's, it's this weird thing where like Verizon like wasn't minding the store, which let people make cool shit, but because they weren't minding the store, they also weren't promoting it. So it became like this weird, like thing. I don't know. Tr- truly, yeah, there were many moments. Step child. Not, not to talk too much about it, but like there were definitely many moments where I was like, are we, are we, are we definitely allowed to do this? Am I going to get into an edit and they're going to like cancel this episode? Because this seems crazy. Truly. Yeah, no one I was like, you I know, I know they want a 10 minute episode, but are they really cool with four minutes of credits? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the move we pulled. Um, I love it. Uh, well, I, I'm still going to kind of go back to my thread because I'm, I'm just uh, hoping for some positive validation in some way, but have you ever bought a show in the last two years? Or, and when I say bought, I just mean like chose it to develop for Amazon or uh, Skydance or wherever you're at that did not have like this incredible pilot script, but came with like a proof of concept or a pitch deck or an attachment or like, because I don't know, like Catherine Bigelow, you mentioned, I don't know that she 
like writes all her own material. Like, has a show ever come to you that the pilot script isn't what got you excited, but something else about the project did? Oh, a thousand percent. It happens all the time. I mean, I, for me personally, there was a project I think of off the top of my head that I bought when I was at Sony on the film side where the script came in and it was really rough, right? Because the writer, the producer would slip it to me just to be like, hey, what do you think about this concept? And I got to the end of it and I was like, listen, the script needs a shitload of work, but like there's a movie here. I know there's a movie here. And I know I can get it. Like if we could get this script halfway to where it needs to be, I know I can package it and I know we can get a movie off the ground. And it's, again, it's something that one of my uh, bosses at Warner said to me, he said, some, he's, he's like, stop leave for perfection. Sometimes you just need to squint and be able to see the city in the distance, right? And so that to me was one of the things I always live by because nothing's gonna come in. Like that was one of the great, um, the first company, the first job I worked at, again, for this guy, Nathan, was at a company, we didn't have a lot of money, right? So you had to buy like, the detritus uh, of the world that was out there that was broken. So I was like constantly reading, like I couldn't afford to go advocate for like a David Kepp or John August script, right? Or, or Aaron Sorkin script. Cause we didn't have a, we had, I had like $50,000. So I have to like constantly be like, is this a concept? Yes, it's a concept. I can buy this. I can work with the writer. We can try to polish it up. And then maybe we can go out and get a bigger piece of talent to get this made. And so it was constantly sort of like looking for, for those things. And I think if you're an executive and you're looking for something to come in, that's already sort of fully formed, you're doing a real disservice to yourself. And plus, by the way, that means you're going to take like a shot or two a year. I'm a gambler. Like I like to have as many, like I, both literally and figuratively. I like, I like when I go to the casino and I go to play crafts, I like to have a lot of numbers on the table and I sort of approach my development scheme in the same way. I don't like buy everything, but I'm like, if there's something here and I think it's cool, it's like, let's, sh- let's see what happens. Like, let's try to figure it out. Now, let me ask you, I guess, uh, um, when you say, you know, you, you see something interesting in something, maybe the script is okay. It kind of feels like maybe it's missing an engine or something, you know, there's no one attached, but you, you feel like there's some potential and you're saying, let, let's give it a try. Let's gamble on this. What does that mean? Does that mean Amazon sp- puts up some development money to the writer or like, how do you get invested in a project beyond just saying that you're interested in it. I mean, yeah, we buy the script. We buy the script. We usually have some development steps. And it depends, like the situation uh, with the script at Sony was a situation where I thought the writer had real talent, right? But I think the script, like I said, was really rough. And so I had that call that I talked about, you know, a couple minutes ago. Where I, I called the producer, the writer. We got on the phone. I was like, here's the thing. I, I'll be honest with you. Like, I think the script needs a lot of work. I think there's a good concept here. Because it needs a lot of work, I'm sort of taking a flyer. I'm not going to pay you a ton up front. Like, we're going to we're going to do minimum here, but I'll make sure that in the back end, like you get taken care of. If the movie goes, we'll make sure you have a good like compensation and bonus there, and I'll make sure that you're protected. So even if you're not getting full credit, if you're getting shared credit or whatever, that you're getting. I'm going to make you a producer on this thing. So I really incentivize the writer to come and bet on their self to you know be part of the process. So that's a situation where it's like, and that way I can go to my boss and show that I was being. I was doing the cost conscious thing of like, I'm not going to pay a million dollars for this, but I can pay this much money here. We can take some cheap steps. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but at least we tried it. And I can, I, there was a path to getting it through sort of the grinder, right? So yeah, to answer your question in a long-winded way, it's about buying the script and then spending real money on development. And again, this is a situation where if it's, if it's super broken or if it's super rough early on, then it's going to inherently be a cheaper price. But I try to set up those deals where if it gets made, the writer is not screwed over, the creator the creator is not screwed over, that they get a seat at the table as hopefully a producer when I was on the film side, or they get some sort of other compensation that keeps them incentivized to, to work. And is there a minimum, if they're not in the writer's guild, do you still do a WGA contract with them? You know, so if we we are, in any major companies, like what's called a quote unquote guild signatory, which means they have to pay WGA minimums and then get the writer into the guild, um, you know, they're independent producers I work with who are working with young writers. And when they buy stuff, they buy, they're, they're not in the guild, so they can pay less. But that also depends on whatever that, you know, producer or financier has enough cash on hand to pay. Right. And then have you ever developed a show out of like IP that's not a show, like a, an interesting person on Instagram or like a, a book or a proof of concept or a short film? Like, have you ever adapted anything like that into a show there's definitely been stuff on articles that i've developed and there's been like you know uh, what do the, the kids call it today the TikTok or whatever the kids say like where i've gone and i've like contacted people there was actually a comedian this guy that i think is super talented that i saw him on 
Instagram and he was like posting, he was like reposting his TikToks to Instagram. And I was like, this guy's really funny. And so I sent his stuff to like 10 people. And I was like, who are comedian friends of mine. I was like, I don't work in comedy. I work in drama. I was like, but you guys should watch this guy. Cause I think that there's something here that I think could be interesting. Right. So yeah, all the time. I think that like, it also makes me feel better about myself when I go down at the a fucking K hole of like an hour on Instagram. Like, Oh, but this is work. It's really work. What yeah, I'm, yeah, doing, I'm here. doing research. I'm doing research. Totally. It is. <laughs> So I guess um, I was going to ask also about like attachments. Like I I had a script that I, I wrote with a friend and it it did well, like at, at some festivals, like writing, you know, competitions. And we won it. We someone from FX had reached out. And he's like, oh, I heard you won this competition. Like, can I see your script? And we were we had this producer that was helping us out. And he was like, don't just send them the script. Like we should get a producer attached, an agent. We should basically kind of package this before we bring it to a network um, because it'll it'll have a higher chance of gaining getting traction there. Is there anything to that? Yes, I mean, it, but it all it, these are all gradations, right? And it's all about sort of like where you as a creator feel comfortable exposing your material. Uh, there's a, a writer that I really respect that when I was younger gave you a lot of good piece of advice. And like one of the things he always talked about was it was like he referred to it as the object. Um, and he's like, whatever you you bring an object into the studio, the more fully formed that object is, the harder it is for that studio or network to say no, right? Because think about it this way. If you're a writer or we're at dinner and you say, oh, what do you think about this uh, this underwater basking weaving article? I'd be like, yeah, that could be that could be a show or a movie. And it's like, but that's dismissive, right? There's nothing really there. But if like you go out and you write that script and you come to me, I'm like, well, it's a little bit harder for me to say no, right? Because then I have to read and assess the script. Now, and if you, you know, write that script, is it a movie or a TV show, for instance, right? Like, it, like it just literally you take that step even without even thinking about it, right? It's that much more. So you take, yeah, yeah, because you've now you've now formed the object a little bit more. And if you attach a director, you attach a piece of cast, and it becomes a more like you begin to like. Uh, what's the like you, you begin to find a statue within the stone right and the reality is is that like in a world like executives are hungry for content we all want content we all have to fill these di distribution pipelines especially on the streaming side of stuff where you, you if you look at a, a company like netflix who wants to do whatever it is like forty thousand hours of new content every year i don't know what the, the fucking number they want to do now is but it's like they need to fill that content pipeline in the same way that like Hulu does, in the same way that we do or uh, Apple does or whomever, right? And so the reality is, is that, and people sometimes ask me like, well, how did these crappy movies get made? And I'm like, well, it's not who, again, we want to make crappy movies, you know, or, or, or bad content, but when we're developing stuff and a package comes along and it's like, it's 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 Ocean's Eleven and it's Brad Pitt and George Clooney and it's Steven Soderbergh and it's this script. I, I actually personally love that movie. But when you bring that package to market, it's a lot harder to say no to that because you're like, well, this is the thing that I can go make right now and I need to fill this slot. And so we're going to go make this piece of content. But to your, you know, Oren, to your specific question, when you come in with a fully packaged thing, it, I'm not saying that it's definitely going to get made, but it's a lot harder to say no to of like, well, do you, it, it, I guess the better example is like, what do you want for dinner tonight versus I made reservations at 630 at Moza. I'm going, if you want to go, let me know. And like, well, I am hungry and I don't really want pizza, but I'm hungry and this sure. reservation already exists. So let's go. Our squash blossom in season. Um, exactly. But uh, sorry, that's a mo Moza joke, everyone. Um, but no, but to, to your point though, Matt, there is a reality where like the package maybe becomes the wrong package, right? Or like, maybe you have talent that's attached. It's an easy example where, you know, if you, your dinner reservation is for somewhere like a little low budge, a little, you know, like if you're like, honey, I just made reservations for Domino's. Yeah, Planet Hollywood. Yeah, Planet yeah. Hollywood's a hard yes for me, but that's a different deal. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like if it's some, if it's somewhere that's not quite uh, exactly exciting or if the person maybe has some baggage or whatever, do you ever run into that situation where you kind of meet a young hustler and, and you know, it doesn't go that way because of some of the attachments or baggage. Oh, yeah, a hundred percent. Because again, the talent that one studio responds to, another studio may not respond to. Right? Like I remember being at Warner's, and there were writers and directors on our list that, for whatever reason, the studio had had a bad experience with, and it was like they could have the best spec, and it's like, yeah, we're probably not going to buy it because, like, that's 
that's we don't work with that person, right? Or there were people, there were writers that had bad experiences with us, and he'd be like, yeah, I don't want to work with Warners, right? And that wasn't all. That was very, very rare. But there will also be times when I would talk to a producer and be like, so and so is like this person is like on, on you know, because what happens inevitably is that like a, a, a script comes in to a studio's weekend read pile, the whole studio reads it, all of a sudden, like you know. Oren's the hottest writer at Warner Brothers. And for Warner Brothers, like Oren is like the guy you Hold get. on, sorry, our, our internet was breaking up. Can you say that a couple more times? Oh yeah, Oren is the hottest writer at Warner Brothers. Um, <laughs> where all of a sudden Oren's on every list inside Warner Brothers, but to like Sony or Paramount or DreamWorks or Fox, if they're like, Oren, sure. Like he's not, like we, we prefer, you know, Steve Zalian or we prefer, you know, Lindsay Beer or we prefer like Jessica Gao or any of these other like writers that are out there. And so it just depends from studio to studio, like who's meaningful um, for, you know, that time and place. And so like, I think it's sometimes you have to accept the fact that by getting a piece of talent for one studio may close the door to another studio. And that's why you should try to go for the people that you like, because what you ultimately don't want, it's sort of like the thing that I said to my friend who like wanted to write the action spec that would sell. It's like, yeah, maybe you go out and you get this like hot TikTok star that's going to get it sold to this one place. But if you hate that person and the show gets made and the show doesn't work because you attach this one person, then like you're going to be angry at yourself and wouldn't it be better to get the person you want and maybe the budget's a little bit less maybe you don't sell it to a major you sell it to a, a mini major or you sell it to like a you know a smaller streaming network but you were able to keep your artistic vision like that's fine too but you just have to be okay with a smaller budget maybe right so it's all about sacrifices and what you're willing to live with as you sort of go down this path and process right well i want to just my second to last question can you tell us about a time recently that you developed a project that came from a new filmmaker, like a first time, a, a person that just is starting on TV. And can you tell us why you, you chose that project? Yeah. I mean, um, so the thing that I bought last year was essentially this guy's like, I think like third script. He, he had had a whole different life. So, and just, just to clarify, when you say third script, you mean that's very few scripts. Like he's yes. just beginning. Yeah, yeah, just he's yes. That's not a this brag. Particular... That's like, oh, this is he's just warming up. Is what I'm saying. He's yeah. just, exactly. He, he's just warming yeah. up. Where it was the thing? I just read it. I was like, I, the, the quality of the writing is undeniable. Like this writer is just good. Uh, and like I was, in terms of dialogue, scene description, flow, making you want to turn the page. What do you mean by all of that? I for me, I'll be totally honest with you, and I hope this doesn't crush writers listening to this podcast. But like, I. I sort of know 15 pages in whether or not like I'm into the writing or not. You can just tell the, the, the syntax, the grammar, the flow, the attitude, like everything. You can just immediately tell like, Oh, this is good writing. Right. And I do believe that like, you know, there's that thing where people are like, oh, it's about marge. And one of the things I think is funny is like when writers are like, well, do you, how do, how do the margins? Like, I don't give a shit about the margins. Like Quentin Tarantino <laughs> d- does it spell correctly in his scripts and his grammar and syntax are awful. But like the flow of his dialogue, the flow of his scene description, the way he hooks you in, the architecture of his scene work is like so compelling that you're like, yeah, I'm, I don't care that he misspelled bastards like 15 times the first four <laughs> pages of, of Inglorious Bastards, right? It's just, it's an inherent, it's by the way, and it's subjective. But like when I like for a perfect example, there's this guy, Little Marvin, who created the show Them for 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 Amazon, right? And before I was even hired at Amazon, a friend of mine who was a producer was like, "Yo, I read this thing. You should read it." And I started reading Little Marvin's pilot, but what would eventually become Them. And like five pages in, I like put the script down and called you know his agent at the time, this guy uh, Bob Homan fired Maybank, and I was like, "Guys, I have to meet him." Like I just I I just immediately new and that was something to you know to your question Oren, uh not to tell little marvin's story but i'll tell a little marvin's story which is that he had been a writer here like i think like 14 years ago and had left the business and moved back to florida to work at qvc like doing like home shopping stuff and had written them as a pilot as sort of a thing of like i want to give this just like one more shot and now it's a show with it's getting ready to have its second season on amazon that's because he like wrote it and it's like it was and i know that probably like probably frustrates a lot of people to be like, well, how that's, how can I, like, how can I do that? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, like little Marvin just, he worked for 10 years to perfect, like at, even though he was working at QVC during the day at night, he was just like constantly writing or rewriting and consuming 
content and trying to figure out like, what would be his voice. And that's sort of where it got there. So I guess the long, sh- a long answer to your short question is yes, I have advocated and bought stuff from, from, from very young writers. And it's like first five minutes, just great opening sequence, great flow, great dialogue, great whatever, like they're painting images in your brain. And that's it. There's no, there's no rules of what you want. It's just when you see it, you kind of know it. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's I feel like, um, I just, I'm sure like all three of us do like just watch uh, a lot of shows, watch a lot of movies, read a lot of books, read a lot of scripts. And the reality is, is that, uh, you just know, it's like, you've been, it's, it's, it's like you ask like a football player, like, how did, like, how did Peyton Manning know he's to make that pass? Like, he was like, I just, I, I've been doing it for 20 years. I just know. Right. And it's like, it's not that I'm comparing any of us to Peyton Manning, though I feel like you guys probably are professional level NFL players. It, it's just an inherent gut instinct. And it only comes from the, you know, the 10,000 hours we all put in to sort of get there. I also think about, you know, there's this, there's that show Quarry that was on, I think, Cinemax. And I remember reading the pilot. Uh, my friend Matt DeRoss sent me that pilot. And like, I remember there's a scene in the pilot, which I won't ruin for people that haven't seen the pilot, when I was reading it, I actually physically put the script down. I had to like get up and like walk around for a minute. I was like, that's such a fucking great turn in the middle of it. I was like, how did he totally trick me? That's a fucking great moment. And that like, amped me up to get back down and read the script. When I read Scott Frank's pilot, not his pilot, but his, his feature script for Godless when I was like, like a young executive, like you were six pages in. And granted, he'd written amazing movies like Get Shorty and Out of Sight that I already loved. But like six pages in, you're like, oh, this guy can fucking write. Like there's just, there's a whole, there's a different, there's a magic to it. There's an intoxication to it. And that to me is like, that's heroin. When you like watch a movie where you're just like, you're in the hands of a fucking master or you read something and you're like, this person just knows how to have a turn of phrase. Like that's makes all the difference. Well, what I'm hearing here though, and I think it's interesting is like, you know, you're, you're talking about like how much media you're consuming and how you can still get incredibly excited about it you know i think that's something special and i I don't know that there are that many people out there that would you know get physically excited from six pages of the screenplay do you know what i mean like i think that is something that like thanks to your passion and also your experience of knowing like what something is really special you know when you've got that in your hands i think that's special but i think that it's worth pointing out i guess is what i'm saying and to me that oftentimes means the difference between a a great executive and somebody who maybe wants to be doing something else, you know, like, uh, the more I work, the, the more excited I am when I meet people who are advocates for artists and who recognize great, who love recognizing great talent and great material. You know, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, the reality is I was like a fat nerd who had nothing. My mom was a, a single mom who was a movie theater manager. And like when my grandmother could take care of me, she would take me and put me in, at the projector booth and I would just like watch movies all day. So I don't necessarily think it's anything more than the fact that like, I don't have, I, I don't have much of a life and I just really enjoy going to like watch movies and read books and like that sort of stuff. So like, it's for me, it's what gets me because well, no one's getting rich anymore. Right. So it's like, this is the thing that like has to make it worth it. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Awesome. Mr. Bezos might be getting a little rich. <laughs> but yeah. he's doing Amazon Web Services. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, well, Matt, we could, uh, we could talk to you all day, and we'd love to have you on the show again sometime soon. But uh, you know, you, you've got a, a busy schedule. Do you have a few minutes to hang out and endorse with us? Yeah, sure. Let's endorse away. Unpaid endorsements. Uh, there's a new documentary uh, available on Hulu called Everything is Copy, and it's a you know like a little uh, biographical documentary about uh, Nora Ephron that uh, I really enjoy. It you know it's not perfect to say, but uh, you know if you love the writing of Nora Ephron, then it it delivers. You know what I mean? It kind of hits all the beats of like the history, you know, your favorite moments, some like behind the scenes gossip on how certain things came to be. Um, and all of the people that she affected and the uh, people who knew her well. And so it's a, a wonderful little documentary, Everything is Copy, on Hulu. Um, okay, I'm going to do two real quick. First of all, friend of the show, Tony Ascenda, the show he directs some episodes of. Dave has a second season that just came out. My wife can't stand it, but it is. I just love it so much. It's not for everyone, but it's so bonkers. Like, And, you know, Ben Sinclair, who sure. directed the guy. High Maintenance the and guy, plays yeah. the guy in High Maintenance. Yeah. He directed a few episodes. He directed one with that Benny Blanco is in, you know, and him and Dave just have this like 20 minute long 
fully naked montage of them hanging out together. <laughs> Just one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. The only place it seems not out of place would be on high maintenance, but now this is on Dave. And I don't know. I just, I just love that show. It just like surprises me every single time. <laughs> There's the scene where Dave is uh, using the toilet and like in a public restroom and someplace sketchy and some, and his friend, I think Gator or something is like, Hey man, why aren't you using a toilet seat cover? And Dave like looks behind him, you know, the toilet seat covers are mounted on the wall. He's like, Oh, you mean these like diaper changing things? <laughs> He's like, no man, those are, you don't know what those are? Toilet seat covers? And it just, I don't know, it just made me, every, now every time I've gone to a public restroom since then, it just I crack up every time I see toilet seat covers. Like the idea that someone would think those are for diaper changing. <laughs> I could totally see why they would, but they're obviously wrong. Um, so Dave, season two, I'm really loving it. And then uh, I started using this new website that a storyboard artist introduced me to. It's called Boards. It's B-O-O-R-D-S dot com. And if you're working with a storyboard artist, they can upload the storyboards to, to this website. You can rearrange them however you want. And then you can, you can write captions, notes. You can download them as a PDF, make, basically make the storyboards and rearranging storyboards like in, you know, Keynote or whatever you use, um, is always so annoying. But here it makes it super easy. And you can even give them notes. You can draw like, Oh, move this person's arm here. Or there, the eyeline should be looking in this direction. And it's a super easy way to, for filmmakers to collaborate with storyboard artists it's called boards, B O O R D S dot com. It's really awesome. awesome. I'm excited for that one because that is a surprisingly annoying part of dealing with storyboards. Yeah. Usually I'm writing notes and then like, they're like, Oh, sorry. When you said the daughter, yeah, I thought you meant the uh, other part. Yeah. Rearranging them is always so strange yeah. too, you know? Yeah. That's great. That's so exciting. Um, that's, I love uh, Dave. Um, I, so I'm, de I'm definitely very excited to check out season two. I, oh, I've, yeah. I've loved him since, you know, I sort of like watching his, uh, his rap videos, whatever, like, you know, yeah, little Dicky stuff. Little Dicky stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, in the first episode, he's literally in Korea. With, they have like one of the bigger, like K-pop stars is in the show, just getting offended by Dave and not working with him. And he's there filming a music video for his song called, I took a shit in Korea. And it's like, I mean, it's just so absurd that I can't believe any network is actually making it. And it's it's good. I, I love speaking it. Speaking of uh, mandates, I actually think that that's FX's mandate is like, if anyone else would make it, they don't want to make it. I, I'm super, I don't know if you guys have seen the trailer for uh, for uh, Taika Waititi's new show, Res Dogs. Yeah. Oh, the, res so good. the Reservation. Yeah. Yeah. The Reservation Dogs. That, yeah. I am super, Sterling Harjo, who created the show, I think he's a super talented writer. And I, the minute I saw that trailer, I was like, motherfucker. Like I want, I wish that was a show we had made because I'm like so jealous. I'm so, I haven't even seen the show. I was like that, the trailer FX cut and knowing that talent, I was like, this looks dope. Um, I think that I'll, I guess my two, it, well, I'm like, it's funny because during the pandemic, I've actually been spending a lot of time like on just be a fucking pompous asshole, like watching a lot of Criterion uh, and reading a lot of like reading a lot of like old like Lynn Dighton novels, but like the the sort of the, the three quick things that I'm super into are one uh, there's this podcast not the, the best podcast obviously your guys podcast but but a distant number two uh, is this podcast called Hardcore History, which is by Dan Carlin. Oh yeah, yeah. Which I love. Which is you know it's a, he takes an event in history. It's like well in order to understand this event we got to go back like 150 years. And these podcasts are like 30 hours long as he goes from like the past history up to this current event. I just think it's really fascinating in terms of like, right. didn't he make a video series too? Or am I mixing him up? with? He else? may have, I've only heard the podcasts, but I've spent a lot of time. Like that's the one thing about the, well, there's a lot of things about the pandemic that suck, but the lack of a commute, it means I can't mm. like, I have to like figure oh, yeah. out ways to like, listen to this. So that's one. Matt, <laughs> Matt said podcast listening went down during it, it did. COVID because of Industry that. Industry wide, for sure. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me 100%. Um, so that's one. Uh, another one, as I'm obsessed with this document or docu series on Netflix, just to show that I do watch the competition, uh, call F1 Drive to Survive. And I've now become like a full mm. F F1 head. I've heard about that. Yeah. It's, I was in London for a month for work and had to quarantine, obviously, before I went out to go to set. And I was like, I, I, binge that series in like a day and a half and now i watch f1 every sunday which i love Whoa. Then, wow. like you're where do you watch it you're like into it now 
Oh, I'm a dude. I, yeah, the, yeah. Now that they've explained the drama, because before when I was a kid, I was like, I didn't get this. And now like, I understand all the relationships. And I'm like, I'm a diehard Carlos Sainz fan now. And like, I like Gunter, who runs the Haas team. And I'm like, my, and now I, I, my friends and I have like these insane text groups. We're now like texting every Sunday at like six in the morning going through this. Um, have you seen Senna? Oh, yeah. That documentary is amazing. That documentary? Yeah, that also made me like have an appreciation for racing. Like I didn't realize it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's yeah it's it's pretty intense yeah. um and then the weirdly the last thing that i uh nerd out on is you know the guy uh david sandberg who directed shazam is currently directing shazam too mm, yeah of course has this awesome youtube channel and i just like i love watching what he's like and it's always being like oh yeah i like i'm just lazy because this guy in the pandemic made like five shorts with his wife you know in a uh, who's who's also a very talented creative and the two of them just like made all this cool shit the fact that he like breaks everything down i'm like we should all like we should all be directors. Like we, the fact that he's doing this with like a like a thousand dollar lighting kit in his iPhone, this is insane. Well, it feels yeah. even he does worse. He's a black magic camera. Does use but... black magic <laughs> it feels even worse when you are literally a director married to an actor, which is both of our cases. <laughs> yeah, I'm always like talking to my wife, like, "Come on, let's just make a short." She's like, "Can I just sit on the couch and finish watching a rerun of Sex in the City?" Like, Fine. I'll leave it for leave it to Sandberg. <laughs> yeah, those are awesome, awesome uh, endorsements. Yeah, Thanks, Matt. Matt. yeah, this was so great. Um, uh, how can listeners uh, keep track of you? Learn more about the projects that you're working on. Uh, I mean, the, I'm not the important piece. The, it, the, the important piece is the talent that I'm working with, and if they just like support, you know, some of the great shows at Amazon and really across networks. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm competitive, and when I see a great show on another network, I'm like jealous about it. But the reality is, we need people in theaters going to see movies, we need people at home streaming content. So everyone should just watch everything and be passionate advocates on Twitter and social media and in their own lives to like keep spreading the word on, on great shows and great people. Well, that was Matt Millam. He had to run to go probably buy some shows. Hopefully uh, one of my shows I did here, he said I was a pretty hot writer in town. And yeah, so thanks, Matt. Uh, if you want to find out more about Matt Millam, what he's working on, what we're doing, anything you heard about in the show, you can check out the show notes at justshootitpod.com. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is justshootitpod at gmail.com or our phone number is 1262-SHOOT1. We love a voicemail. We answered a couple of listener questions last week. We're excited to do some more in the near future. So let us hear your voice. Plug your movie, your website, whatever. Ask us a question. We'd love to play it on the show. Uh, 1262 shoot one. We're across all social media at just shoot it pod. I'm on Instagram at O Kaplan. I'm on Twitter at Smitey Pileg. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlo across all social media, including Letterboxd. Shout out to my new Letterbox friends who I assume are listeners. This episode was edited by Sarah Weirda. Social media support from our social media maestro, Derek Aiello. You're listening to music provided by the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.